everyone, welcome to my channel. It's Spooky Blog here, also known as Rebecca. Thank you so much for joining me. Um, I'm so excited about today's video. In fact, right now filming this, is, I'm like nervous because it's different. It's, um, it's different in its content. It's different in a little bit of my format that I'm not, you know, that I'm used to. So I'm just like, oh my God. Today's video is going to be a collab with Sarah from Better Off Red. Woo! I, I am a fan of Sarah's. Um, yes, I, I found her channel a year ago, and I think it was through other YouTubers, like maybe Kate the Great or Michelle Wang, or yeah. What really got my attention was last October, um, Halloween season, she did a Pennywise gender bender. She was like, oh, she had this cosplay, she had the costume, it was amazing. And she does a lot of effects makeup, she loves horror, she loves um, the topic of what we're doing right now. Um, so yeah, so she's fun. So I will link her channel below and um, go ahead and check her out. I felt like I need to expand my little corner of YouTube here. I'm, I get nervous and I get really like uh, asking people things and so I don't collab a lot and I decided to spread my wings and uh, talk to the cool kids at the lunch table. So she said yes and I'm very excited. So her bio is like, wrinkles, freckles, whatever. Um, if you want a makeup artist for the DMV, holla. I just feel like we're both kind of like sarcastic and dry and I don't know. She's clever and I dig her and so I think you will too. What we are doing, she has a series on her channel called Crew Tribe. Yes, it's just a play on words. It's what you think it is, but we say it different and then YouTube doesn't get as mad. Now also, it's just because we say things wrong. She's like me, I say things wrong a lot. Crew trying. She has some stories on her channel. Basically the format is talking to the camera and telling you guys what this awful story is about while doing makeup. So it's not about necessarily the makeup and featuring product. I won't go into that detail. I will just be applying my makeup and telling you guys about some horrific murder. Please do know if this is not your genre and you are not used to this kind of thing because there's a ton of podcasts out there right now and there's a lot of just sort of crime junkies and that's a podcast actually. Yeah, we are murderinos and if you are not that and this uh, subject matter uh, upsets you or makes you uncomfortable, then uh, no harm is meant by this. I have very much respect for victims, families, and the gravity of the situations discussed. Um, this is just sort of my fascination. I just want to say that. So if you'd rather just watch me put my makeup on and mute me, I'm totally fine with that. If you want to skip this video and check out a previous video or wait till probably tomorrow or the next day, there will be a new one back to our regular programming. So, thanks. Okay, so Sarah's gonna give me my assignment. Yes, we've given each other assignments um, for what to do for these um, topics. Okay, ready? What do you got for me, Sarah? Hi, Rebecca, frugalistas, frugies, frug, frug, frugs. Thank you so much for having me on your channel. I'm really excited to do this collab, do some crew time. Crew time. Some crew time. So the story that I thought would be the most interesting for you to tell us as a Washington native is the Green River Killer. Hmm? How could you not? Okay, you're in Washington. This happened in Washington. I want to know all the dirty details and I want to see you get pretty while you do it. <laughs> I know that sounds weird, but you guys, trust me, you're going to love it. I'll just be watching like this. Great, thanks so much. Love it. You have to go to her channel, subscribe to her channel, and check out her video for this series and see what assignment I gave her. So, the Green River Killer. Oi, oi, oi. You guys, I remember this. Okay, so, Gary Gary I live in Washington State. I live, um, I grew up. Uh, very near where all of this took place. It was something that um, kind of followed my childhood and into adulthood. 
1982. Let's 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 go there. Um, I was 10 years old. I was in the fifth grade. I liked Lisa Frank and my sticker collection. I would uh, I was in the Discovery, you know, the gifted program at school. So I was having all kinds of fun and um, just, you know, life was great. I came home from school and I watched the Carol Burnett show in Little House on the Prairie. I remember, okay, so 80s kids, 70s kids, you know how it is. We are just like, our parents didn't shield us. Like, I feel like my parents parented me well, but I feel like we weren't shielded. We were just like, Whatever awful thing was going on the news at the time um, was just like, you know, dinner table discussion, not discussion, but like the news was on, the local news would be on, and we would be at the dinner table and, you know, and I just remember these reports of uh, missing women and then these, you know, bodies being uh, discovered in the Green River. And the Green River is a long body of water that runs through South King County and uh, it encompasses several cities and there was this strip of highway called Pacific Highway South or well P PHS and um, it's freeways well, I mean freeways existed, but my parents were kind of like, oh, we'll just drive this long ass street with all these stoplights past, you know, strip malls to the airport or wherever they were going. <laughs> like now my parents are still like that. And I'm like, she's like, did you, did you go on Pacific Highway? I'm like, no mom, I went on I-5 like a big girl. In, in like two months, six women were pulled from the Green River and it was like, what the hell is going on? And it, I remember not really being creeped out, but just kind of like, oh my God, what's happening? And also because, you know, Ted Bundy was already incarcerated um, and serving his prison sentence, but that was kind of the the claim to fame for Seattle and, and uh, our area, in fact, the lake where Ted Bundy got like those first two victims, like Sammamish, is I've been there with friends tons of times and boating and, you know, so it's, um, anyhow, I just remember when I was hearing about these bodies and I'm like, oh my God. And then they would say on the news, they're like, uh, runaways are prostitutes. And then, you know, just the way we were conditioned, we would kind of just not think much about it and I, I I've learned so much now and we don't call them prostitutes anymore they're called sex workers and if um, yeah so the first victim felt pulled from the Green River was Wendy Lee Cofield age 16 in July 1982 okay five more bodies would be discovered from there Giselle Laborn 17 Deborah Lynn Bonner 23 Marcia Faye Chapman 31 Cynthia Jean Hines, 17, and Opal Charmaine Hills, 16. All strangled. Yeah, and I think, oh, I'm putting, my, I'm putting concealer on my eyelids. Nothing to see here, people. God. Uh, see, I'm, I'm sorry, Sarah, I don't wanna mess up. I wanna do a good job for you. So, of course, detectives and all, they're like, these gotta be related because it's, you know, bodies are found within, like, even though they're all within close proximity, both in time and in place. And I remember like being around the airport and that was where like Pacific Highway South, cause that's where these uh, girls would last be seen. And that's right by the airport. And I remember we would drive, you know, we would pick up relatives or we would go on trips. And I'd be like, I'd think about these women and just be like, oh God, this is where those people are, you know, kidnapped from or murdered from. But because I'm like, well, they live high risk, you know, that's not me. And, um, you know, so anyway, I, uh, I just, it, I didn't relate to it, but uh, in, as many times as I can, I want to be clear about victims and their names because I feel like we always talk about the, 
the serial killers and we're just like, whoa, whoa, how is this? And we hardly ever talk about the victims and I think that's changing more now. I think we're kind of identifying um, the importance of honoring them and talking about them and naming them. And basically what happened were was the Green River Task Force was formed and it was, you know, of course, detectives, officers and such, but the the head was uh, Dave Reichert, um, the head of the sheriff, he was the sheriff at the time, uh, Robert Keppel and John Douglas were like the main guys on the, the team. They actually, in, about, in 1984, they consulted with Ted Bundy in his prison in Florida. And um, of course, Bundy kind of in his own egotistical narcissist way, he shared some facts with them, or I should say he shared some kind of profile assumptions about who they should be looking for, like, you know, advice. And then they found out that he was kind of giving his own recount of some of his crimes. And I mean, that's so typical for these kinds of guys is they just, you know, live and bask in their uh, glory and accomplishments is how they see it. But anyhow, what they said was, or excuse me, what Bundy said was, you've got to just, you know, see if this guy is probably visiting the victim's bodies where he's dumped them to have sex with them. Um, sadly, the body count kept rising. I mean, there were dozens of women in the 80s that, and girls, you know, like 14, 15, 16, 17, um, and all of them considered to be sex workers if they were reported missing as well. And, um, or, you know, like, well, sometimes they would say, oh, you know, that's just a teen runaway. All right. So sadly, teams of forensic scientists, um, detectives, um, I mean, they, thousands of tips, hundreds of pieces of evidence, and they could not figure out who this murderer was, is they didn't know if it was more than one. They didn't know, um, you know, if it was a guy acting alone, they just, they didn't know. And, um, it was, it was baffling and it was very upsetting. And sadly, I think based on, you know, like politics and stuff like that, um, the task force began to disband because they really weren't, um, getting results and there had been no arrests made. And, um, so it was really frustrating and it was upsetting, I think, to the community. But like I said, we were always told, well, you know, these are high risk women. And then you just kind of shrug it off. And honestly, the fact of the matter is this guy has more victims. His body count, his, his kind of notoriety seems to be swept. We don't hear about him as much as some of the others because I think of his victims. His victims weren't like these Oh, promising college co-eds that, oh gosh, had their life ahead of them. Instead, you know, it's some single mom who's doing sex work to pay the bills and she goes missing and then turns up dead. We're kind of like, oh, okay. And I'm not saying that's okay. I'm saying that is kind of the culture of the news cycle and what, you know, we're, we've been conditioned. In 1987, so uh, murders, the murders are continuing. Uh, victims are turning up and uh, there was, I, this guy, Gary Ridgway, was, um, was actually, his truck was given, uh, his truck description was given as a witness, from a witness about one missing woman to the task force. And then he ended up getting, he was arrested several times for uh, soliciting sex workers in that area. And so he got, um, he then was uh, questioned and he even took a polygraph and he passed it and they couldn't find any evidence against him. But thankfully 
they thought ahead and note and you know they were just like hey can we get some samples from you and so they took hair and blood and saliva I think and um, and so they took some DNA samples from him and stored them fast forward to 2001 a uh, the the task force was totally you know like non-existent a detective he sent to the Washington State Crime Lab he sent a whole bunch of TNA samples from the case to get tested because now obviously forensic testing had improved since the 80s and they could see if there was anything to to find and lo and behold a victim's swab taken against their evidence of suspects there was a match and it was Gary Ridgeway and they showed up at his work at the Kenworth truck manufacturing down in where he'd worked for 30 years and arrested him after his shift was over and then it was like wait what I just remember we were all going I mean I was like married and with I had I was a mom by now and I'm just like holy crap they finally caught this guy <sighs> so who is Gary Ridgway besides really gross and awful so, Gary Ridgway uh, was born Oh, in 1949, and uh, he grew up in King County, Washington. He was held back um, several grades. He did not do well in school. Um, he graduated from high school in 1969, I think, um, which he was 20 at the time. His mom was really domineering. Um, he was a bedwetter, and she would humiliate him for it and um, you know just scold him for it and all this stuff so that was bad when he was 16 there's a story of when he was 16 he lured a six-year-old boy into the woods and stabbed him and he said he just did it to see what it was like to stab someone this yeah but he did actually end up joining the military um, and he served in I want to say he served in for a few years, he got married. His first wife, he got married in like 1970. Um, and then he went into to the Philippines with the Navy. And he actually, that's where he kind of discovered um, sex workers and would, um, you know, solicit them. I'm fixing something. If I have a feeling that this is not the makeup artist rule book of fixing things, but that's just the way it goes. I think he got a couple like STDs or something from them and then he was like he'd blame them you know like they are filthy you know ugh. and I'm just like buddy whatever anyway um while he was away uh in the Philippines his wife cheated on him so that did not I mean that just kind of definitely crushed his ego um, because he just had a lot of resentment for women and probably from the way his mom treated him and um, yeah so he divorced her then he remarried and this woman um, they uh, I think they married in like 72 which wasn't you know it's a short time span <laughs> Like, how do these guys get these? Uh, yeah. Uh, he gets married again. He has a son. And this second wife, she kind of, uh, I think she was like, red flag because Gary liked to have sex outdoors and in public places. And um, he would like to take walks in the woods with her, but walk behind her and pretend and and try to be as silent as possible and then uh sneak up on her and it was like a game he said and you know and he you know he just was like oh did you hear me did you 
did you hear when I was walking behind you? And then he would like put her in chokeholds for fun. And she's like, yeah, I'm out of here. So she noped out of that uh, marriage. And um, she got, uh, what's the word? <laughs> Custody of their son, but he got like every other weekend to visit. And so he found a place of his own and he had a room for his son. And um, for when his son would come, his little boy would come. And uh, anyway, and the reason this is significant is because so when he, you know, in 82, when we knew of the first victim, and then shortly thereafter, and all the years following, um, what they found was he brought them to his home um, under the guise of, this is where we'll have sex and I'll pay you, where he said he would, you know, they would have their transaction um, he would walk them on purpose past his son's room and they'd be like, oh, you know, and some of these girls are like 15. Um, anyway, so they would be like, oh, okay, this guy has kids and no big deal and he's, he's, he's harmless enough. And then of course, no, he wasn't. His third wife, um, she moved into the house in 1988. They were married and he actually, that is when we kind of didn't hear much about victims anymore. Like it seemed like things got settled down. Um, he says he was happy and he didn't see, he would, he would kill women when he felt either a woman at work got a promotion and he didn't or he got mad about something, or he felt embarrassed about something, um, and any kind of his anger, he said he would take out on finding dates um, to kill, and that he just sometimes had the urge to kill, and he would <sighs> strangle them because he just thought that he could do it, it was effective, he said, and that, you know, why why do anything else that could be messy and then he um would put them in the back of his truck and sometimes just go to work and then after work he would go and find his dump spots to bury or drop them whether it was a body of water like the river or even a uh, construction site, golf course, um, wooded area, etc. In fact, my brother's apartment complex down there um, in one of the locations was um, a body of uh, uh, remains were found. And I remember um, she was 15 years old the day she was murdered was the day she was reported missing. Anyway, um, so what happened was um, they did a plea. They were only able to kind of connect him to about five, five, seven of the victims and they just knew that there was more. And so at first they were gonna do the death penalty and as much as, I mean, we don't have to discuss like morals and ethics here about death penalties and stuff like that, but um, states that have death penalties in a way, what's kind of good about them is they really give prosecutors leverage. So they wanted to find out more detail. They wanted to know if they could find closure for some of these missing women. They wanted to know if they could get some remains identified. They, you know, they were, they just knew there was all of these um, victims and he was only connected, they could only get evidence to connect him to like five or seven. Um, and so what they did was they just basically said, look, you give us every information you can, tell us everything, and we won't give you the death penalty, we'll just give you life. And he agreed and he told them everything and he went out in the wood, you know, he went places and helped them. I think they only recovered like four victims, but they think he was responsible for up to 70. Gary Ridgway is still in prison. 
He is in Washington State. Um, I don't know. He was moved. I think he was... They shipped him off to Colorado. It was Colorado. And Colorado was not happy with that. So then they brought him back. But he is cooperative. Uh, I watched a uh, biography on him. And it was more victim centric, which I appreciated, and also more from the um, the women on that task force, because we never talk about them. In fact, even I didn't just now, which my apologies, that's not okay. Basically, they, um, he was, he was very polite, but he definitely had some issues. Like I mentioned, I mean, he clearly, had a strange, I mean, you can have whatever kink you want, but if you're making your wife do things she doesn't want to do, or uh, having sex with corpses, <laughs> that's not okay. So, um, but he, yeah, he had so much resentment, and he just had such low regard for these women, these women and girls, and he just, just did not care that they were even human. And even though he cried at his sentencing, uh, prosecutors were like, they weren't buying it, I guess is what you could say. So on the official King County prosecutor's statement, which is a very um, heavy document to read, you can find it on Murderpedia. Uh, he's, they say, even when Ridgeway claimed to feel remorse, his expressions of this sentiment were patently false. I'm sorry for doing it, but I just wasn't killing a person. I was killing, I don't know, I'm gonna say it, but they were just in the wrong place at the wrong time. He murdered women simply who were in the wrong place at the wrong time. This man is, this is a man devoid of human sentiment. He preyed upon a community's most vulnerable and attributes their deaths to fate. Why did Ridgway kill? He suffered from no mental illness that would absolve him of responsibility for these crimes. He murdered his victims deliberately, methodically, and systematically. He was uninhibited by any moral concerns. In five months of interviews, he displayed no empathy and expressed no remorse. He killed because he wanted to. He killed because he could. He killed to satisfy his evil and unfathomable desires. And that is the Green River Killer. Blah! Which I have to say, despite li living through that time and it being local news and feeling kind of um, a connection to the geography and um, the situation, I did not know that much and I learned a lot and my if you want to like you know read up more um, Wikipedia Murderpedia like I said there is a an official statement of the office of um, the prosecutor for Washington State and then of course there is the documentary I mentioned I think it's on the oxygen network um, so it's very sad. We honor these women and we do better now as law enforcement and community and media and we make sure that we give um, sympathy and you know this this um, these women were not in the wrong place at the wrong time. They did not deserve to die no matter what they did or tried to do to earn money or earn a living or, or what so. Thanks Sarah. Thank you, Better Off Red, for my assignment. Well, I hope you enjoyed. Um, if you didn't enjoy the story, I hope you enjoy this, my face. I'm going to list everything I used below. So be sure to check out Better Off Red. Say hi to Sarah for me. And um, thanks so much. I appreciate you watching. Oh, and if you're from Sarah's channel, welcome. Thank you for joining me. I so appreciate it please hit that subscribe button. I'm not as uh, 
predictable in when I post. So if you want to hit that bell for notifications and then you won't miss a video, I upload a few times a week and I focus a lot on like drugstore and sensitive skin, women over 40, but I throw in some bougie stuff too. <laughs> and some fashion, you know, got to mix it up. Anywho, alrighty guys, thank you so much. Take care. I'll see you next time. Bye.